Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. Hey, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. And today's cool fact of the day is that there's yet another reason to eat more fat. A typical adult like you or me has about 50 billion fat cells, so there are more fat cells in a single human body than there are fat people on our planet, and that's a cool fact. Today's show might be about fat. I don't know if I telegraphed that well enough for you, but our guest is Johnny Bowden, PhD, who's known as the Nutrition Mythbuster. He's a board-certified nutritionist. You might have seen him on Dr. Oz, Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, and all the other three-letter entities that uh, Johnny and I have probably appeared on and lots of the other guests on this show. Uh, you've also seen his writing in the New York Times, Daily Beast, Men's Health, and places like that. He's written actually 15 books, including one you may have heard about called The Great Cholesterol Myth, which was co-authored with Stephen Sinatra, a well-known cardiologist who was one of the first big cardiologist voices saying, dude, eat more fat. <laughs> and Johnny's latest book, and the one we're going to talk about today, was co-authored with a very well-known physician named Stephen Masley. And the book is called Smart Fat, Eat More Fat, Lose More Weight, Get Healthy Now, published by Harper One. Now, you might notice that there's a similarity between what you read about in the Bulletproof Diet and what you read about in Smart Fat, and that's because eating more fat works. And there are lots of nuances and lots of things you can do. So I love to bring guys like Johnny on the show to talk about what they did and why it works, because understanding that there is a science, understanding that it's not just a lone voice, it's a whole community of people who are health professionals or people like me who are unlicensed biohackers who just look at what works. And what we're finding is that we kick more ass when we eat more fat, and that's just how it is, and it doesn't matter how many low-fat, like shaky, weak people are telling us that we're gonna die. That We don't look like we're gonna die, we don't feel like we're gonna die, our labs don't look like, like we're gonna die. Basically, it just, it just, it works. So, Johnny, welcome to the show, and thanks for Thank shouting out that this stuff works. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'll never forget when I first uh, heard of Bulletproof, I was actually speaking at a conference, and you guys were exhibiting and I had not I had not yet heard of bulletproof coffee. And I said, "What is this stuff?" And I explained to me. He puts the butter in the coffee. And I go, "God, this is exactly what I've been believing in for the last fifteen years. I've been talking about this is great." So I've always um, had, had found that same synergy you're talking about when you meet like-minded spirits who come to the same conclusion, read the research in the same way, tried it in their own lives, and then you find, "Oh, I'm not the only one who's been saying that." That's very nice. So, well, in, yes. in the, thank the, you for all you're doing with oh, that yeah. as well. You're you're so welcome, Johnny. Uh, in the in the dark early days of this fat days. thing, we had Gary Tobbs uh, just kind of wrote "Good Calories, Bad Calories," a very famous book. Uh, for people listening who haven't read it, it, it's the only book I've ever seen that's about 500 pages without one wasted word. Every page is full of facts and this incredible story woven in about how we were deceived into believing that a low-fat diet is an appropriate thing for humans to do. And it actually is, for short periods of time for specific biological reasons. But if you try and live on a low-fat diet, your life is going to suck. That, yeah. That's what it comes down to. Pretty much, pretty much. Uh, you know, I, I was a true believer in that, Dave. I don't know if I, I ever told you my background story, but, you know, when I got into the field in 1990, it was all low-fat diets and aerobic exercise. I, I started as a trainer at the Equinox Fitness Clubs, and, uh, you know, we used the tools we had, the food pyramid, you know, the step classes, aerobics. And, and, and the worst part of it is we would train to actually believe that if our overweight clients weren't losing weight, they were probably lying because <laughs> oh. we knew this worked. <laughs> We I was knew. so. If I was, was one of them. I, I was that three hundred pound guy who worked out six days a week, and no one believed me. I'm like, are you kidding? I'll show you my logs, right? Yeah. And this is exactly what people believe because they never. It, it's so interesting how the mind works like that. When you when you have a belief, and believe me, the the belief in low fat is like a religious belief. It's just it's impervious of evidence. The people who believe it just won't see anything that that contradicts it. And when, when you have a belief that's strong and the evidence doesn't support it, you have to find something wrong with the evidence. So when people were doing the low-fat diet and taking 25 step classes a day and not losing weight, we had to think, well, something's wrong here. It can't be that the advice we're giving them is wrong because we know that that is infallible. So it must be that they're either cheating or they're not telling us the truth. 
<clears throat> and it really winds up blaming the victim because this low fat thing was the biggest nutritional experiment in history. It's a massive failure. Uh, it, it doesn't work logically. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't pass the smell test. Our caveman ancestors didn't eat low fat woolly mammoth. I mean, and, and no, no society on earth has lived on a low fat or, or a, a no protein or no uh, uh, fat diet ever. And um, yet we continue to proselytize for it. There are doctors in America right now who are going on every talk show in the country telling people we should have statin drugs in the water supply and vitamins just give you expensive urine and we should all be eating low fat. And those seem to be the mantras that the establishment still embraces. And as you and I know, not only is it not true, it's very destructive and it's part of exactly why this country is fat, sick, tired and depressed. Some of my favorite detractors say things like, uh, it doesn't work because it can't work, therefore it didn't happen. And it's this bizarre internal like, like pretzel logic. Yeah. Yeah. And like, like one of my favorite ones is, is, Dave, you never weighed 300 pounds. I'm like, there's a picture of me when I'm 23 in Entrepreneur Magazine and my face is like this big. I don't even look the same. And it was published like a hundred, I don't know, half a million copies, however right. much circulation is. Right. I'm like, right. I don't know how you make that up. Yeah. But, but the idea that you can go from that to fit and to do it with butter instead of beating yourself up on a treadmill, like, man, I'm grateful that such things exist. And the fact that there's a, a chorus of voices now who are just standing up and saying, you know what, screw that noise, it's cool. But yeah. what I wanna know is, when you were that trainer at Equinox Fitness telling the fat people that they were lying, which you probably well, did. Well, we didn't tell them that, but that's what we believed. Yeah, and you're like, well, you know, you just need to try harder. My, my favorite too is try harder. It's like, I'm putting every ounce of energy I have, you know, like, what do you mean try harder? Like, how about pounding sand, right? So, but what, what was the one thing that happened that made you go, wait a minute, like, like, what was the first time you realized, wait, this fat thing matters? Two things happened. The first was that in the early 90s, uh, Dr. Atkins had a kind of yeah. renaissance. You know, he first published his very first book, The New Diet Revolution, 1972. But there were a couple of editions after that. When I got in the field in 1990, he was starting to get some buzz again. Mm -hmm. And there was starting to be some research about it. Now, we, the true believers in low fat and, you know, aerobic exercise, it's all about calories, calories in, calories out. That's why you get fat, eat too many calories. You know, that, that belief system, um, obviously, we did not believe in Atkins. And our, we would have clients, and I remember one in particular, but we'd have clients who did everything we told them, just like you did, and it didn't work. And against our advice, they'd go on Atkins. And what we would say, <laughs> all of us, the, cl the collective trainer body, would say, you can't do that. Look, you might lose a pound or two, but you're going to get a heart attack. What's going to happen? All that saturated fat, your cholesterol is going to go up. You're going to die. Stop the insanity. You have to shave I, your head right there. Stop the then. insanity. Remember, right, <laughs> I, I show a picture of her in my slide presentation. So what would happen is they do it against our wishes and against our advice, and then they'd come back and they didn't die. Not only didn't they die, they'd have better blood pressure, better blood lipid test. Their triglycerides would drop like a rock. Their belly fat was starting to go away. They, they, they looked better. They felt better. And they, this presented what psychologists call cognitive dissonance. Here's two pieces of evidence that don't fit together. Low fat works and, and high fat kills. Here's these people going on high fat diets. Not only are they not dying, they're 100% better. And by the way, Dave, I would see this entrenched belief system up close, these guys would go, these men and women would go to their doctors and the doctor would say to them, my God, this test is amazing. And look, you look fantastic. You lost four inches off your back. This is amazing. What did you do? And they'd go, I went on the Atkins diet. And they'd go, you can't do that. That is going to kill you. So they, it's like they wouldn't believe the evidence of their senses. So that was number one. It, it, it got me to kind of question what we had been taught. And it's kind of what started me on the path of becoming a cholesterol skeptic. Because as you know, everything we believe about fat and cholesterol are absolutely married together. They are the Bonnie and Clyde of nutrition. You can't talk about one without the other. They're very, very interrelated. Because after all, the only main reason you've ever been told not to eat fat is because it raises your cholesterol. And we all know the cholesterol causes heart disease. So if that's not true, True, the whole thing starts to collapse like a, a, a house of cards. That was number one. Number two, very early 1991, somewhere like that, an unknown biochemist from MIT had just published a book and he came to give a lecture at Equinox. He's trying to get some publicity for this book that nobody ever heard of. The book turned out to be The Zone. 
And the MIT biochemist was Barry Sears. And he comes in and he gives this lecture to the trainers and he talks about how we've got the whole calorie thing wrong and how it's really hormones that run the show. And food has a hormonal effect. It is not just about the number of calories, but it is about how those calories instruct your hormones to either jump into action or go into hibernation. The food is actually instructing its information for your hormones. And this was a radical concept, radical. Now, Dr. Atkins had talked about it when he talked about insulin, but you have to remember that Dr. Atkins was a pariah in the medical community. Everybody hated him. They, they just thought he was a quack. You know, he was not appreciated. He was such a, a genius, but, you know, he was very easy to dismiss. Plus, he was kind of a curmudgeon. He didn't make a lot of friends. So it was very easy to put. It was not so easy to dismiss this MIT biochemist, Barry Sears. So he starts talking about the hormonal effect of food. And I went up to him afterwards and I said, Dr. Sears, if what you're saying is, is correct, then everybody else is wrong. And I don't know if you know Barry Sears, but he's not lacking in confidence. And he looked at me and he smiled benevolently and he said, that's exactly right. Everybody else is wrong. And that kind of, those two things together made me say, wait a minute, there is more to this fat and cholesterol stuff than we've been being taught. Um, and I want to get to the bottom of it. And, and personally, as, as just as a human being, the, my driving force in life is that I hate bullies. And what I was watching here was bullying. I was watching the American Medical Association. I was watching, you know, uh, uh, doctors who really know nothing about nutrition, who are being pompous and, and presumptive and, and just, uh, you know, telling people what they ought to do and not knowing what they were talking about. And I watched people literally be bullied into this. And, and the, the victimization of obese people remains to me just a, a cause to love because this is the last acceptable prejudice in America. You know, comedians can go on late night TV and make jokes about fat people, and people do not understand the myriad of things that actually go into weight gain, hormones, metabolism, the microbiome, gut health, uh, a stress. There's just a hundred different factors that nobody's looking at, and everyone's just saying, it's all about diet, it's all about uh, exercise, it's all about calories, and it's not. So, you know, those were the things that kind of began me on the journey of questioning the establishment when it came to advice about weight loss. And I did want to make one one comment about this whole eat more fat, feel better, lose weight, and all the things you and I talk about. I, my great uh, nutrition teacher and mentor, Robert Crayon, the late great Robert Crayon, used to say, the problem with the American mentality is that we tell them something great about fat, or we talk about the Mediterranean diet, and their takeaway is, oh, I guess I should add more olive oil to my cornflakes. So I want to be very clear that we're not talking about taking your crappy diet and just adding more fat to it and magically things are going to, going to change. We're talking about making some very important substitutions here, removing some of the inflammatory omega-6 fats that we've been taught are so healthy, removing some of the carbohydrates that drive insulin through the roof and make us inflamed and contribute to obesity and replacing that stuff with the healthy fats we should never have taken out of our diet in the first place, including saturated fat. What do you think about the, the evidence-based uh, bullies who are out there saying, well, you know, it, it's all about calories in, calories out, you got to exercise more. And I still see this, especially among like the, the bodybuilder, like I, I want to look muscled but emaciated in terms of like extremely lean, you know, the bodybuilder physique, which is pretty amazing when, when you pull it off. But I see a lot of like online hate from that crowd. How do you respond to, to that kind of a, a perspective? It's like there was no evidence that anything but calories makes a difference. You lock someone in a calorie chamber. What, what is your response to that? Well, it, it, there's, there's several responses to it. Um, <laughs> I mean, other than your middle finger. <laughs> <laughs> Well, people get very attached to belief yeah. systems. You know, my, my, my previous life, my master's is in psychology, so, which served me very well in working with weight loss and with personal oh, yeah. transformation. I, I, and by the way, it's the perfect time to, to point out, I mean, another thing that we share besides a love of fat and, and a, a hatred for the bullies in the establishment who tell us to eat the diet that makes us fat, sick, tired, and depressed. Aside from that, um, is, is this uh, sense that... Um, the whole, the whole calorie thing is, uh, is a belief system. And, and the thing about evidence-based medicine that, that people throw out there all the time and that we, uh, you know, it just, it gives me hives because it sounds great. It sounds like we just want to do what works. 
But what you have to remember is who controls the evidence. The drug yeah. companies love evidence-based medicine because yeah. they run the evidence. They run the trials. They control the studies. And then they can say, look, statin drugs, we have the evidence. And if you know yeah. anything about how research is done and how it's reported and how it's funded and how the whole system works, you know that it's, that's a rigged system, evidence-based medicine. It would throw out every single natural remedy that's ever been used that ever has any kind of a clinical track record, nobody would ever use it because there's no evidence in the sense of a, 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 a clinical trial, fourth level clinical trial funded by multi-millions of dollars by the pharmaceutical industry. So, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of the notion of evidence-based medicine. My, yeah. Again, I mentioned Robert Crayon earlier. He used, to, he used to have a wonderful saying. He'd say, the entire New York City Fire Department does not have one randomized clinical controlled style that sh uh, sh uh, uh, study that shows that water puts out fire, but they behave like it does. So, I mean, are you going to throw out the evidence of your senses and what works and what you try and what you were because there's no evidence that was that was produced by a pharmaceutical company i don't think that's, that's a great that's the problem with with the the evidence-based community it's not that evidence is a problem evidence is wonderful and clinicians rely on evidence every day yeah. you know i hit someone with a hammer it hurts Th yeah. that's evidence i that's didn't have true. to like blindfold them and hit him with a hammer in different places to see if it right. hurt right like like we know sometimes because there's many different kinds of evidence and the the art of evidence-based whatever you're trying to do is, is pretty much reject the evidence you don't like because you say the study wasn't good enough, accept the evidence you like because it was double blind, and then ignore all the clinical data, ignore all the clinicians, and ignore millions of people who, who got better doing whatever it was because you don't like it. And you don't like it because it can't work because of your- Because you know it doesn't work. Because yeah, you know that it doesn't yeah, work. It's because of your dogmatic belief. So it's actually like a, a self-tortured cycle there. I'm all for evidence. And if you want to say what you're doing is evidence-based, what you're actually doing is you're saying everyone who doesn't agree with me is a, is a con. Right. And if that's the world you're coming from, like I don't need to spend my time on you because right. you don't understand basic science. In fact, you've rejected basic science by worshiping on the altar of, I only take one of six or seven kinds of evidence and I am blind to the rest of the world because of my belief systems. It's like, go join ISIS. Like That's yeah. where you belong. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. And the whole belief in the calorie thing, I mean, uh, I, I think you're seeing, I think we're beginning to see a critical mass in people, in, in respected mainstream yeah. people even, moving away from the calories of the whole story thing. I mean, with David Ludwig at Harvard, you yeah. cannot get more credentialed than this guy. I mean, <laughs> he's, he's a great he's, guy, right? He's unbelievable. And he just published a book about it and said, dude, sorry, but the calories was... thing just ain't working. Because, because as Barry Sears taught me back 25 years ago, Food has a hormonal effect. So, yeah. you know, in our book, in Smart Fat, thank you for mentioning, um, we actually go way beyond the good fat, bad fat dichotomy, which is so woefully out of date. I mean, it's like the good cholesterol, bad cholesterol stuff. We've gone, we've gone so yeah. far beyond that. We now know there's five different kinds of LDL cholesterol, five different kinds of HDL. They, they operate differently. We're the same thing with good fat and bad fat. The fact that there's that some fat is good and some is bad is not revolutionary or new. That's not if, <laughs> if that's all we had to say. We wouldn't write a book. What we do here is divide fat in terms of whether or not it's toxic. Yes. So this is such <laughs> a different way of looking at fat than the conventional way. And and you know, Dave, one of the thing, one of the bullying principles that has driven me crazy all along is this notion that if sat that saturated fat is bad, animal products are bad, everything else is good. And in fact, here's what the evidence really shows. The vegetable oils that you've all been told to eat that are supposed to be so healthy, we're supposed to swap everything out for canola oil and soybean oil and cottonseed oil and, and, and corn oil and all of these things that we got, we got rid of lard. Remember in the 80s, oh, yeah. everybody decided, you know, natural, healthy fats like lard. Oh, bad. So they all switched over to canola oil. So that's really good now. Those are the most inflammatory oils on the planet. They're highly refined, loaded with omega-6s, which are the precursors for the inflammatory cascade in the body. Now, we need some omega-6s, but they need to be in balance with our anti-inflammatory omega-3s. They should be in about a one-to-one -one proportion. We consume about 16 times more omega-6s because we all think vegetable oil is so good. So not a good fat. On the other hand, the saturated fats we've been told are so bad are only bad when they come from feedlot farms. And let me give you a, a great example of, uh, of this that I think most people can understand. I live in Southern California. Uh, about a year or two ago, we had a big E. coli scare. 
And it was traced to spinach. It was traced to this one farm that was making spinach. It got contaminated. No, no, no. no sorry. All- sorry. Spinach is plant-based. It, it can't be bad for you. It yeah, right. 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 Exactly. It can't be bad. <laughs> so not one health professional, not one, went on the air and said, don't eat spinach. It's bad for you. Yeah. They all understood that something had been contaminated here, right? It wasn't don't eat spinach. They recalled the spinach that was contaminated. Now we all eat spinach. The same thing is true with animal fats. They are not bad because they come from animals. They are bad because they come from contaminated animals. Because in feedlot farms, here's what happens. Number one, (laughs) they're nothing like farms. They're mega agribusinesses, thousands of acres of cattle kept in tiny little stalls. First of all, they're fed grain, not their natural diet, makes their stomach acid. Second of all, they're fed tons of antibiotics. Third of all, they're fed steroids, bovine growth hormone, all these things to fatten them up. Their fat absorbs all the pesticides and the grains that they shouldn't have been eating in the first place. Then they have to get more antibiotics because their stomachs get acid. So you've got a toxic waste dump of an animal here and then you're eating it and you're going, oh, animal foods are bad. No, that animal food is bad. If you go to a real farm, and you get pasture-raised cows where they graze happily on grass and they eat some worms and insects and their omega-3 content is high and they don't eat grains so they don't have acid stomach and they're not fed antibiotics, that is a health food. So there's an enormous difference between saturated fat or any fat that comes from a toxic waste dump and saturated or any fat that comes from a healthy animal or a healthy plant. And that's the distinction we make in smart fat, not the difference between animal versus vegetable or saturated versus unsaturated, but between toxic and untoxic, non-toxic. And then there's a whole class of fats that we call neutral, which Yes, there's not massive human evidence that shows that they're necessarily beneficial the way, say, the fat in coconut or olive oil is, but there's also not a shred of evidence that they're harmful. So they're neutral and you can eat as much of them as you want. Although if you eat as much of the neutral fats as you want, you're probably eating fewer of the better fats, right? Probably so, but the so there's, you know, there's a displacement. A little, well. You're absolutely right. But but what I'm saying is that this is a much more important distinction between the old good and bad fat yeah. that was divided according to saturated versus unsaturated. That's just not so. One of the biggest factors in, in my research that, that's not well understood, something that you touch on in smart fat, is the idea that, that fat itself is a toxin store. So if you take a, a, a fat person and you biopsy their fat and you look at mercury, you look at lots of the pesticides, you look at endocrine disruptors, the body uses fat as a storage organ for toxins that cannot be metabolized in the liver because the liver is overloaded. So sure. it, tox- toxicity is a driver of obesity. And there's a type of toxin that's made by mother nature and by man. Uh, organophosphates are the man-made ones and mycotoxins, toxins from mold in food, specifically moldy grain, which is a major issue in, in agriculture. Mm-hmm. These toxins are called lipophoric. Right? And that means that they are fat loving and they dissolve into fat the same way that food color dissolves into a glass of water. Mm-hmm. And then you eat that fat and it goes into the animal's fat. And we eat the animal's fat, it goes into our fat. And these toxins are correlated with neurodegenerative illness, with cancer, and specifically with lesions in your arteries. At least, wait, when pigs eat mycotoxin contaminated food, they get atherosclerosis. When we eat pigs that ate mycotoxin contaminated food, are we going to get atherosclerosis? Well, I believe so, and it's it's one of the reasons, well, what your pig ate actually matters. A pig Mm -hmm. that ate fresh food is gonna be a really amazing source of bacon. A pig Mm -hmm. that ate industrial grain that had the highest possible limit of mold that wouldn't kill the pig, which is what they do, because moldy grain is cheaper, then you should expect to feel like crap and be inflamed after you eat your bacon. Like, that's how it works, right? That's exactly right. You, you said that beautifully and accurately, and, and I wish everybody would take that home and tattoo it underneath their eye, eyelids because that is the truth about it. So it has nothing to do with whether or not it, the source was a pig or a, a soybean field. It has to do with whether or not that has been contaminated. And as you point out so accurately, we all store toxins in our fat. Every mammal on the planet does. So do the cows that are coming from factory feed feedlots and the pigs that come from the and and even if you weren't an animal rights person as I am or you didn't care about animals, for selfish reasons you should care about how they're treated if you're eating them because it's a very, very different animal, pardon the pun. A grass fed cow and a factory feedlot farmed cow are not the same animal from the health from a health point of view. That's uh, that's definitely a point where we we agree radically. Yeah. Now, when you look at 
and vegetable based fats. Uh, well, so, yeah, go ahead. I mean, we have this this whole like, oh, if it's plant based, it must be good for you. And yeah. there's plant based proteins and there's plant based fats. And my favorite plant based protein is sarin, the nerve gas. Uh, uh, the, the one that killed all the people on the Tokyo yeah. subway. It is a plant-based protein, which is absolute proof that plant-based proteins are bad for you. Yeah. Well, right. except that that kind of logic of plant-based and animal-based is meaningless. Yeah. Right. So if we reject that and we say, all right, there are some oils. Some oils come from uh, different plants. Some oils come from different animals. You can take animal fat and break it into all of its little types of subcomponent fats. You can take vegetable fat and break it into all of its little subcomponent parts, you can rearrange them on different glycerol molecules. That's mm-hmm. triglycerides, yeah. uh, uh, medium chain triglycerides, might we say. Mm-hmm. I, I use some of the medium chain triglycerides, but not all of them in my products. Mm-hmm. What are the types of fat, whether they're from, from vegetables or animals, I actually don't care. But what are some of the types of fat that stand out as most metabolically beneficial in your work? Well, certainly, since you started with coconut oil, I mean, that's a great one. And and by the way, may I give you kudos to your, your brain octane? Because oh, after, <laughs> I inter- after I interviewed you for my uh, Truth About Fat Loss Summit, and you talked about the difference between M- conventional MCT oil, yeah. which is, you know, the, the fats that are found in coconut oil. A lot of people use coconut oil and get the MCTs that way. Sometimes they use purified MCT oil and you have the brain octane. I, you were so convincing that I ordered two bottles of it from your website and I they will now pry it from my cold dead hands because I use that every single day. And so that certainly MCT oil, whether in the purified form of brain octane or whether in, in another high quality form is one that I think we can we can say has have good health benefits associated with it. By the way, uh, we're about to release a study showing a, a huge difference in the number of ketones formed from brain octane versus coconut oil. Ah, like, like the evidence is in from a, a major uh, University of California source, Great. and like I, I can't wait to publish that because it's going to blow the water out yeah. of the, the fat. I, well, I love your brain octane. So there, there's Thanks. one. Um, there are some oils that. I'll be very honest with you. My co-author and I didn't quite agree. Like I would have made Malaysian palm oil a smart fat. Uh, Stephen didn't feel there was yet enough human research to say that this is definitely a beneficial fat. He was totally in agreement that it's gotten a bad rap and there's nothing wrong with it. I would go a little further. I I think I'm actually leaning towards feeling that there's enough research to say that this is a smart fat. But in any case, it's loaded with carotenoids. It's loaded with tocotrienols. That's what gives it the red color. That's a great oil. Uh, I, have a, I, I have a question on that one. Yeah. So I, I'm a fan of tocopherols and tocotrienols. And in fact, I take them concentrated. But palmitic acid escorts lipopolysaccharides. These are the, the toxins from gut bacteria right across the gut membrane and increases their toxicity, which is why palm oil for me is on the suspect foods. It, it's much better than vegetable oil, but mm-hmm. it has that weakness that coconut oil and, and like fish oil and things don't have. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that was my big concern. Do you have any any comments on, on that? Factor? No, you're, you're a little further advanced in the biochemistry uh, spectrum than I am. Yeah. And I, I so I have not seen any negatives uh, associated with that, maybe in the proportion that it's found in palm oil. As, a, as an overall oil, I think it's it's pretty good, um, not, but but to go into less controversial areas of, mm-hmm. of oils and fats that have been found to have like beneficial, certainly olive oil, oh, you yeah. know, in in all the Mediterranean diet studies, and and um, is it okay to cook with olive oil? I mean, I have an opinion there, but what what's your take? Uh, it all depends on the temperature, and one and mm-hmm. actually, I will tell you one of the things I learned from my co-author Stephen Masley. He was a trained chef. He took a year and actually studied at the Four Seasons for a year while he was in medical school. Cool. Um, so what we learned about that, and, and I had to correct some of my previous uh, beliefs about oils, is that the smoke point of oil is the point at which it becomes something else and when it actually converts to substances you don't want. So you never want to cook it with an oil at a smoke point. And I had always believed Coconut oil, you can cook at five, six hundred. No. You can't. It's, <laughs> no, you it's can't. got a smoke point of two fifty. And the more now, when you refine the oils, you can go higher smoke point, but you got less good stuff in it. So like there's a the trade off. Brain octane will go to three twenty. Right? Okay, that's still yeah. not deep frying. But we, you and yeah. I, don't recommend you deep frying anyway. You shouldn't so deep fry anything anyway. It's it's just bad. Like yeah. so, even if the oil is amazing, it won't be amazing when you're done deep frying. Right. Yeah. So so uh, can you cook with olive oil? Not you have to think of it this way. 
why do we pay ex- so much money for true extra virgin olive oil? That, <laughs> exactly. that was olive oil that is, is close to a bunch of old Greek men walking around in wine bottles and pressing it out with the mechanical press of their feet. There's no high temperatures associated with extra with real extra virgin olive mm-hmm. oil. And you pay extra for it because the temperatures destroy these very valuable polyphenols yeah. that are found in the olive oil. So why would you pay twice the money for extra virgin olive oil and then cook it at 400 degrees? It makes no sense at all. You're then going to destroy the very thing you paid extra to have. So I would say that with extra virgin olive oil, you should not cook with it. It's best for drizzling and last minute putting on of stuff or salad dressings. And when you get to virgin olive oil or just plain old olive oil, yes, you can cook at higher temperatures with it. But of course, it doesn't have all the wonderful stuff in it that um, that the extra virgin olive oil has. One, one of my favorite Italian recipes, this is not in, in Bulletproof, the cookbook, but it's beef tagliatelle. And, and you take a, a piece of beef and you cook it relatively rare and you slice it and you pour extra virgin olive oil on it. Notice you didn't pour oil on it, then cook it. Yeah. You did it in the right order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, and that's just so nice. you agree with that? I mean, that's that's been what my finding. Well, it, I, I agree with it. And there's there's a few people, like like Chris Kresser wrote something recently saying, oh, it's okay. Like, like there's there's no evidence um, using some of the studies. Like, like there was something about like blood sugar decline after it. But I found the evidence to be unconvincing and the biochemistry is pretty clear. Heat, light, and air mess up olive oil. Olive oil has more polyphenols, so it stands up better than mm. olive oil stripped of the polyphenols, but it's still a, not a good idea. No. And it, there's just no reason to do it. Like, use butter. It, it is simply a better choice. Use ghee. Use coconut oil. And frankly, if you do that, add some water so that the temperature won't rise too much it's so a good that point. then you protect the oil. If you want to deep fry something, like you... Like, go eat a Twinkie. Like, deep fried food is never healthy, no matter what oil you use. Very you well put. And down, I would add to the, the list of fabulous oils that I wasn't quite as aware of, avocado oil. Yep. Smoke point of 520. Dude, if you can't cook your stuff in 520, yeah, there's something wrong with you. And that stands up to heat very well, and it's loaded with omega-9s and, you know, very, very good oil for you. And again, like, uh, like you and I would probably agree, I, I'm a big fan of saturated fat. I mean, I eat bacon. I did a webinar actually in, in promoting the smart fat launch called why a top nutritionist eats bacon, where I kind of deconstructed all of the objections to bacon and showed how you can cook it in a healthy way and how you can eat it in a healthy way. Because when it's nitrate free, not cooked at high heat and comes from pastured pork, that's a damn health food. Let me tell you right there. It's a perfect proportion of fat and, and protein. I make my own bacon, and uh, one of my my very favorite things to do, and, and this is something that's in uh, Bulletproof the Cookbook, and it's in the Bulletproof Diet, is during summer, you get much better quality pork, summer and fall, because mm-hmm. during winter, they feed spoiled food. There's, there's more stored grain, and there's more buildup of these toxins in pigs. Pigs metabolize uh, toxins the same way humans do with their kidneys, instead of their livers, like rats and right. some other animals, or like cows have three stomachs to deal with toxins. Right. So pig fat stores toxins the same way we store toxins, and, and we both suck at detox. Right. That makes pigs a good model for what humans do, and it means that their fat is extra delicious. Right. <laughs> the only problem is that if you're eating winter and spring pork, your chances of being inflamed the next day, not because you got bad fat, but because you got fat-soluble toxins in the fat, it goes way up. So every... Every summer, I buy like eight or 10 pork bellies from Heritage Breed. I live on Vancouver Island. It's a farming community. I live here for a reason because I'm on an organic farm, so I can eat all this stuff. And I buy those. I put them in the freezer, and then I make bacon out of it. And some of the times, you just cut it up, and you roast a hunk of pork belly this big. Wow. If you're listening on the radio, I'm talking like the size of, of I don't know, a, a sheet of paper. Yeah. And... You, you roast that, you score the skin, and it's my kid's favorite dish, and it's, it's just so good, and you get like a food eye from it because wow. you're eating clean fat. It's the right kind oh, of fat, and it's it sounds clean. great. Oh, it it's, sounds it's, great. It's like life-changing to do that. I'll bet. That sounds wonderful. All right, let, let's talk about omega-3 to omega-6 ratios because I know sure. you write about that in, in Smart Fat. What, what's your take on the ideal ratio in food and in humans when you do a lab test? Uh, it's a very simple answer, one-to-one. Look, here, here's, here's the, uh, let me give you the short 15 second elevator speech about omegas and inflammation. Mm-hmm. So we need both inflammatory and anti-inflammatory compounds in our body. Mm-hmm. People often say, to, and, and omega-6s, which are predominant in the vegetable oils we've been told to eat, are, are 
pro-inflammatory. In other words, the little hormones called eicosanoids that come mm-hmm. from, that actually cause inflammation. The inflammatory ones come from omega-6 and the anti-inflammatories come from omega-3s. Now we need both. People ask me all the time, well, what do we need inflammation for? Think about the healing response. Think about if you get a splinter and what happens in the area gets swollen. Well, what is that? That's a kind of inflammatory response. The white blood cells go, they surround the puncture wound. They try to prevent a microbe from getting a hold and starting an infection. The area fills with fluid and water. So it's a kind of inflammatory response is a kind of part of the healing response. It's why you get a temperature and why you get a fever. Um, it's, it's the body way of dealing with it. You need some infl- inflammation or the ability to form inflammatory compounds in the body as part of the healing process. Problem is, so you got these two armies. You got your inflammatory army, and that's being fueled by omega-6s, and you got your anti-inflammatory army that's being fueled by omega-3s. When they are in balance, everything is good. Life's wonderful. When you fund the inflammatory army with 1,600 times more funds then you're giving the anti-inflammatory army, you are in deep doo-doo. And all the research, and I've got the the master book of, of research on this uh, right here in front of me. It's the uh, uh, volume 100 of the World Conference on Dietetics. They did an entire research report on the balance between omega-3s and omega-6s and how this relates to cardiovascular disease. And the research is very clear that we are getting at minimal 16 times more omega-6s in our diet than omega-3s. And then we wonder why we're inflamed. And inflammation is at the core of every major degenerative disease we know of, from Alzheimer's to cancer to diabetes to obesity to heart disease. So we are literally fueling the inflammatory army by eating so many omega-6s. And if you think about every processed food in America, you cannot swing a rope in a grocery store without finding soybean oil and cottonseed oil and corn oil and partially hydrogenated, not hydrogenated. They're all vegetable oils. So it's 16 times more. And that's a big part of why we're so inflamed. So in in the Bulletproof diet, I I found numbers that range from 16 to 40, like up to 40 times. 16 is conservative. I have a feeling it's much higher. That's what the research was able to document. And I think it's much higher in certain parts of the country. And for people listening, what this means is that that if you were to take an obese person who eats a standard American processed and fast food and restaurant, even not fast food, just restaurant foods, because they put these oils all over the place in restaurants, um, what they have is 40 times more omega-6 than omega-3 oils in their body. And that is odd because your cell membranes, which are made of little tiny droplets of fat, they need a certain amount of undamaged omega-6. It's critically important. If you don't have some of that, you're going to be in trouble. But what you're eating is you're eating masses of damaged omega-6 because they fried in it. They cooked with it. And this stuff is unstable anyway. It, it basically goes rancid. It oxidizes during That's- manufacture when they use solvents in it and when it's put in plastic bottles and things. So when you incorporate this damaged omega-6 in excess in your cell membranes, you're creating free radicals throughout the body, and that's the source of your inflammation. But the anti-aging people, so Johnny, I've run an anti-aging research and education group called the Silicon Valley Health Institute for more than a decade, uh, and it's given me a chance to learn all the things I know and to interview lots, like hundreds of of experts on these things. And, And the general consensus there was a ratio of four to one. And, and you'd hear this at the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. Um, I was there this year. I met my wife there 11 years ago. Like, like these are my, my people, even though I'm not a doctor. And when I, uh, when I look at that four to one, and I look at my numbers, I've gotten myself down to one to one on occasion. Uh, I've, uh, right now I'm at 1.7 to one. And the guy who's the most aggressive I've ever met who's a professor, Professor Larry Smarr from UC San Diego. He was down to 0.86 to one. He's the only guy who ever really beat me in terms of that ratio. But I'm concerned at one to one that your that your cell membranes actually might not have enough omega-6 to have appropriate fluidity. Are you 100% certain that one to one is the right ratio versus two to one or three to one? Because I'm not. I know it's around four and it might be lower, it might be slightly higher, but like where, where does that come from? Uh, well, the number that I have always written and, and, and kind of stood by is the range of between one and one and four to one. Okay, and so you're anything, cool with the range. All right. Yeah, I'm cool with the range of one to one to four to one. The one to one comes from the Boyd Eaton original paper on the Paleolithic diet that was published in right. either JAMA or New England Journal. I don't remember which. It's right. a classic paper on the paleo diet. It kind of started the whole thing going. It was even before Lauren Cordain's book came out. And that was about one-to-one. In fact, 
some research in that world um, uh, thing on dietetics that I told you about that talks about ratio found that some Paleolithic uh, uh, or hunter-gatherer um, uh, societies actually consumed 0.7 to 1, who's actually even even less than 1 to 1. Wow. But I'm very comfortable with the ratio of between 1 to 1 and 4 to 1. The one thing I would say to you about your friends and, and the people who are measuring your, your blood and looking at that is that the dietary ratio may not necessarily be the same as the ratio, the yeah. ideal ratio in the blood. So That's you're looking exactly at, right. oh, this guy's 8, 6 to 1. That may not have a, one, a perfect correlation with the dietary intake. I think for dietary intake, I'm comfortable with saying anywhere between 1 and 1 and, and 4 to 1 but not 16 to one, oh, not yeah. 40 to one, not 50 to one, not what we're consuming in America. The implication here is that something I did, so so I, I was a huge Barry Sears fan when he first came out uh, back in the late late 90s uh, when his own diet first yep. came out and and it did make a difference for me. I still had my half my weight, but I, I played with Atkins, played with Zone, and I, I really got into the you know nut oils and, and eating almonds because you need that omega-3. But what I found was that uh, and, and I was a raw vegan too, where I ate tons of nuts. But nuts are actually not that good for you. They're all kind of in the suspect food category because although they have some fat in them and because they're relatively low sugar, if you eat way too many nuts, you are going to get more than more omega-6 than you want. So mm -hmm. I, I'm a, a fan of, of eating nuts. Mm -hmm. But when you do what some sort of, uh, some of the, in the, the paleo community have, have done over time, it's like, oh, look, it's a paleo dessert. It's like pounds and pounds of nuts and a whole bunch of dates, which are actually sugar. And somehow that makes it, quote, paleo, because there isn't like a legal definition of paleo. And, and that concerns me, because when I was eating masses of nuts, my inflammation was not low. When I ate moderate amounts of nuts, my inflammation was under control. Like, funny, that's what the biochemistry says should happen. But nuts by themselves aren't good or bad. Excessive nuts are bad. No nuts is probably okay. And a moderate amount of nuts is great. Yeah, I, let me, to, to speak to that, and I think it's a great place to, to kind of take a, a bird's eye view of all this, is I'm not a fan of any kind of religious yeah. following of any dietary principles of paleo, you can't eat beans, and this one, you've got to eat lots of... I, I, I find that that kind of slavish following of any dietary principles, including my own, is very misguided and, and ultimately not beneficial. And it goes to my second point, which is biochemical individuality. And I think this is something that you agree with. Yeah. And, and it's something that I've embraced ever since the, you know, my first nutrition class ever. Um, and it comes from a book that was written in the 50s by a doctor named Dr. Roger Williams, who actually invented vitamin B5 or discovered vitamin B5, panathenic acid. And he wrote this book called Biochemical Individuality. And what he had done was he, he did a ton of autopsies and a ton of, of live um, you know, analysis of things like the number of beta cells in the pancreas, the, the size of the thyroid gland, the, you know, all, just every possible measurement and metric you could go from in normal people. And he found a range that was like all over the map yeah. in terms of, you know, that, the effectiveness of your cytochrome P450 digest, enzymes in the liver that detox, the size of the thyroid gland, mm -hmm. the size of the, uh, you know, just about any organ you can name, uh, enormous variations. And, and so I always come back to this in saying, you know, when you talk about, well, too much of nuts can be a bad thing, too little, that, that it's always going to come down to what fits you what's the best not what's the best diet but what's the best diet for you the person and and yeah. that may mean that something that the biochemistry says should be fine or something that the biochemistry says should not be fine may be just perfect for you or may be terrible for you you know um i it was when in doing my my fat loss i mean i, I interviewed gary tabs for example and he yeah. said you know i knew at age four i was allergic to corn i get doesn't matter if corn's good bad or indifferent it doesn't yep. i can't eat corn I, Johnny Bowden, don't drink alcohol. We all have, you know, our curse to yep. bear what doesn't work for us. It doesn't matter that there's a million studies showing that two drinks of alcohol a day lowers the rates of heart. Not for me. And maybe, you know, whatever the food was that that uh, that, that triggered some of your research and, and some of the things that had uh, mold in them and things like that that maybe many of us aren't aware of didn't work for you. So I always encourage people. I mean, to me, my mission in life is to get people to kind of be the leader of their own health team and not to necessarily follow the girls, whether it be me or you or anybody, yep. but to find their own path and to use what we tell them as guidelines to test things out and see if it works or not. And if it doesn't throw it out, I don't care what the authorities say. One of the things that took the most time in, in writing the Bulletproof Diet was I developed the, the roadmap. 
And it's got, these things for almost everyone are, are going to make you kick ass. Ghee, stuff like that. There's a big broad set of stuff in the middle that, that I call suspect foods. And the reason is for 20% of the population, this totally messes you up. And you're probably eating those things every day and you don't know it. Perfect. This other one, 40% of the population has problems with it, but they don't know it. Right, And for this other one, it, it's 30%. So you put all these together and you're like, look, unless you eliminate all the things that are causing problems for a little while, you'll never know which suspects are guilty because you always feel a little bit like crap even if you don't know it. Perfect. And, and it was that am amount of science. I can tell you for me, I know every single source of kryptonite in food. Yeah. Everything that makes me weak, I know it is. Everything that makes me strong, I know it is. But what I eat and what you eat, like you said, they're not the same. How much carb do I need? I've titrated it. How much carb do you need? I don't know, but I can tell you the time that's the best time to eat it for most people. And you may be bizarre and you need Fruit Loops in the morning. I just don't really think that's likely, right? Right. <laughs> no, you, you, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, in working with clients, I don't do it anymore one-on-one, -on -one, but 10, 15 years of doing it, one mm -hmm. thing I learned is that there are people who will drink coffee late at night and go right to sleep, and there are people who will take a Valium and go out and party. There yeah. is a huge, huge, huge variation in how people respond to substances, and the action is not in finding the perfect system, but in honoring your own individual differences and deciding what works for you. And I, th I think that's something you would probably agree with. And, and to me, that's probably the most important message of all. Absolutely. All right. We're up on the end of the show, Johnny, and I want to ask you a question. I'm really interested to hear your answer. Sure. Uh, in every episode, I ask the same question. And if someone came to you tomorrow and said, look, based on everything that you've learned, everything you've experienced in your life, what would you tell me if I said, I want to kick more ass at life. I want to be better at everything I do. What are the three things I need to know that matter the most? It's a very, very good question. Um, the first thing I'd probably tell them is to st stop believing the experts. <laughs> um, no matter what it's on and no matter what the subject that we're talking about, that would, that would be a good starting spot. Um, or using, using expert information in, in a kind of different way, not as, you know, when I was in, in graduate school, we had, there was a book that was my favorite book ever, and it was called, you'll understand immediately just from the title, it was called, If You Meet the Buddha on the Road, Kill Him. <laughs> and it was a book <laughs> about not following gurus and not thinking somebody has all the answers. So that would be number one. Um, to me, in my, just in my personal life and my personal experiences and the challenges I've gone through between addiction and, uh, you know, and you name it, um, I, I think that the greatest source of that kind of performance that you're talking about where they want to kick ass and they want to be more and they just want to break through walls and shine always comes from embracing the the dark side of yourself. I mean, all the stuff we keep hidden and we try yeah. not to show people and that we think is shameful and wrong. When we embrace that and channel it for the good and, and embrace it, our performance just all of a sudden we become who we are. I mean, look at it in politics. The two people who are, I know this is going to be evergreen and people will probably listen to this a couple of years from now, but right now we're in 2016 in the middle of the primaries and who's winning? Two completely different human beings who couldn't be more different and all they share is they're authentic. Now, you don't, may not like them, but they're authentic. And authenticity wins out every time, whether it comes to performance or shining or breaking through, it's always going to be about embrace that stuff. You know, Alan Stone has a great song where he talks about where your dirt outside. I mean, actually embrace that stuff that you've been kind of keeping quiet or keeping under under the, uh, the radar. And when you really embrace that and you become more of who you are in the best way and you actually think less about who yourself and more about what you can contribute to others, it just skyrockets, it skyrockets your life in, every, in ways you cannot possibly anticipate. Beautiful answers. Uh, thanks, Johnny. And thanks for being on Bulletproof Radio. Your book is called Smart Fat co-authored with Stephen Masley. And what URL should people go to if they'd like to learn more? Uh, smartfat.com. And of course, my website, johnnybowden.com. No H in Johnny. <laughs> J-O-N-N-Y Bowden.com. And, and smartfat.com. And smartfat.com. All right, we'll put those links in the show notes. Thank you. If you enjoyed today's episode, you know you can get a full transcript of it for free on bulletproofexact.com. And we link to all the cool stuff we talked about. And if you'd like to say thanks, I want to tell you about something that I almost never, in fact, I think I've never talked about on Bulletproof Radio, but I'm going to show it to you because it's something that I'm really pleased with. Bulletproof hot chocolate. Now, if you're watching on YouTube, I just held up the can almost like I was pitching something, but I'm going to tell you something that you don't know about. Hot chocolate 
is amazing when you make it with the right chocolate and with zero sugar in it. So there's times when you want to give stuff to your kids. My kids, they drink Bulletproof coffee. They get little one or two ounce things of it, and that's fine. But if you want to have something that's a little bit more mellow, hot chocolate like that is amazing. But when it's made with only real food, it does something different for how you feel because you're not getting that sugar high. But here's why I'm talking about hot chocolate. I recently did something that was a miracle in the kitchen. I took Bulletproof hot chocolate mix, and I mixed in room temperature grass-fed butter and brain octane oil, and I blended it. And what came out was this ridiculous frosting-like substance that completely transformed pretty much anything I put it on. It wasn't very good on salad, but <laughs> if you wanted some sort of dessert-like frosting, this stuff completely blew me out of the water. So I should call Bulletproof Hot Chocolate Bulletproof Chocolate Frosting Mix because, oh my God, it's good. Anyway, if you, haven't, if you haven't tried it, you probably don't even know I have it. You can make a mocha out of this stuff, but it's one of those things where I really carefully crafted this stuff and I never talk about it. And there are a huge number of uh, friends of mine in, uh, in Utah who don't drink coffee. And one of them came to me and said, Dave, you should just call Bulletproof Hot Chocolate Mormon Fuel. So there you go. If you are in Utah and you don't know I have this stuff, you need to try it. Put some brain octane, put some butter in there, blend it up in the morning, and you'll be bulletproof without any coffee. So have, have an awesome day. Thanks for listening. And serious, Bulletproof Hot Chocolate is amazing.